payment and pricing strategies for social enterprise. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Ling Ling Fung, who is the founder of Two Lings, a business design and innovation studio. And my name is Danielle Sutton. I am the content animator here at Plus Acumen. If you aren't familiar with Plus Acumen, at this point, we are the world's school for social change, and we offer over 30 free and low cost courses for change makers around the world. They've been taken by over 450,000 people across the world. And it includes several courses about improving and growing your social enterprise, including related to selling and um, growing your business through different techniques and strategies. We have a masterclass that I'll mention also at the end of the Learning Lab with Daniel Pink on the art of selling. And of course, Ling Ling Fung is here to share all of the pricing and uh, um, payment strategies to help you grow your business as well. So she is an advisor, a published author, and a speaker on social innovation. And her portfolio of innovations span from infant malnutrition and safe drinking water to education and youth employability and many others, and working with clients and in regions across the world. So we're very lucky to have you here today to share your practical tips and advice on pricing your products and services for low-income consumers. So just a few housekeeping items before I pass the torch over. Uh, we'll be together for the next 60 minutes and we will be sending out a replay after the fact. So don't worry about taking notes, you'll have access to the presentation again. And please go ahead and I already see people are introducing themselves in the chat, which is wonderful. Let us know where you're joining in from. And if you have questions as we go, please post them in the chat and as Ling Ling is speaking, I'll be monitoring the questions. And at the end, we'll have some time to go over uh, the questions and, and get some more specific answers for things that you're wondering about. Um, and as I mentioned, after we wrap up, you'll get the replay in your email and also some links to some of the resources that Ling Ling will mention and some next steps if you're curious to keep learning about this topic. So with that, I will pass it over and uh, really looking forward to this presentation today. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, so hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I see that you're all from all over the world. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining this learning lab with me. Um, I was so excited to be creating this learning lab for Plus Acumen because I know the Acumen community is so full of instigators, change makers, and optimists. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be with you all. Danielle also let me know that there are a few folks from the Earned Income Accelerator where I was a guest mentor a few weeks ago. So um, wonderful to have you back. And it is such an honor to be working with this community. Um, social innovators and just be contributing to your work in whatever way that I can. Um, I just feel really grateful for this opportunity and I look forward to this next hour with you. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to start with some introductions and to get to know you a little bit. So I'll ask Danielle to um, pull up the slides as well as to just uh, send out that poll to you all. Sure thing, I, the slides actually uh, disappeared on me for a moment, so I'm just getting them reloaded, so they'll be up in a minute. Um, but I'll okay. run the poll while we're doing that. Okay, that's no question, no problem. So the first poll, um, the first question I'd like to know about this community is how do you identify? So are you a corporate social innovator? Are you working with a social enterprise or a startup? Are you an NGO innovator? Um, are you working in a government or a donor innovation team? Um, perhaps an academia or a student, or maybe you're just a really curious person um, interested in learning about um, low income um, pricing and payment strategy for low income communities. So I think that poll is out with you all now. Great, and then the second question I have for you is what stage um, are you working in? Are you ideating? Are you um, in the process of developing your concept, testing or prototyping? Um, perhaps you're in the building stage of your social venture or 
um, wonderfully scaling your social venture, or maybe you you all are just pivoting here. Great, I see Jokin is starting up. And uh, I see Prana from Delhi, hi. Great. So I don't know if the polls are ready yet, Danielle, but I'm gonna take a look. Great, so ideation. Oh, it looks like ideation and building are top. And then next is scaling. Wow, you guys are doing great. And then, Danielle, I don't know. I didn't see the, the answer to the first question because I wasn't on the poll, but I was on the chat. Could I take a look at that? Um, yes, let's reset here. I'm not sure if we can pull up the first one again, but we had a lot of, um, I glanced at it when it was coming through social enterprise and yeah. startups. And okay. um, I think some corporate social innovators, we had definitely some from, from everywhere. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's okay. I just, uh, I just, <laughs> that's all right. I didn't uh, see the first poll. Okay, well, that's really helpful. I had a sense that you all would primarily be from social enterprise and startups and, um, a scattering throughout as well. So um, don't know if the slides are ready yet, Danielle, or should I just go ahead and launch in? Um, they should be ready soon. I apologize. They were all loaded and then they disappeared. Uh, so it's just taking a minute. So maybe if you want to get started, okay. I'll throw them up as soon as they're ready for you. Sorry about that. That's okay. So let me first introduce myself and I should let you know that I had to script this a little bit because I'm someone who goes off on a lot of tangents and we only have an hour on a topic that I could speak on for hours. So I've got some notes here um, that I'm just gonna be glancing down at. So again, my name is Ling Ling Fung and I run a design and innovation studio called Two Lings. And this work has been primarily focused in developing and emerging markets. Um, and that means uh, the markets I've worked in are in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South and Southeast Asia. I've been focusing on working on designing new um, innovations for low income consumers and most recently have done some work for looking um, looking at needs for low income school systems also in the US and Australia. So my clients are primarily large corporations and also development agencies who want to bring scalable solutions to um, social and environmental challenges in the marketplace by leveraging their core expertise and assets. Now, I have also done um, some work with social enterprises in startups, and primarily this has been through accelerator programs such as uh, the Plus Acumen um, Earned Income Accelerator that I participated in a few weeks ago, um, MIT's Global Innovation Ideas um, Challenge, um, also Unreasonable Institute's Project Literacy Lab, um, and most recently also uh, Grand Challenges Canada. So I have a bunch of experience in um, corporate social innovation, also with social enterprises. And in the last 10 years that I've been working on early stage social innovation, I recently begun working um, on sharing my learnings, hence uh, the learning lab that we're doing today. And last month I launched a newsletter called Zen and the Art of Social Innovation. Um, it is a fortnightly resource for social innovators like you um, for and you can get free tips and resources to support your work and you can sign up for that on my website. Um, so my website also, since you didn't see it on, there it is uh, on the slides there, um, is www.twolings.com. So that is enough about me and it's wonderful to um, have learned a little bit about you all and I'm looking forward to questions at the end. Now I'm gonna just turn off my video now so I don't distract you all with the notes I've got down here. And let's get started on this learning lab. So this session is going to go through three different angles. Um, the first is the cost to your business. The second is your customer's ability to pay. And the third is the value your offering creates for your customer. Now, I've made some promises on what you'll be able to do by the end of the learning lab. And I'm going to check in with you um, to make sure we've achieved that at the end. And I'd be happy to answer any outstanding questions just to be sure that this lab is helpful to where you are in your work right now. So please note down any questions you have along the way and I'll be very happy to answer them. 
I'd like to start with a story to give you some sense of how I came up with the frameworks I'm about to share with you. So everything I'm about to share with you comes from my experience of designing, testing, and iterating dozens of products and business models in the marketplace. And really the best place to learn is from your customers. I'm sure none of this is new to you all since many of you are already scaling your businesses. Um, the diagram that's on the slide shows you the results of a go-to-market strategy I was designing for, um, for a product to prevent mosquito-borne disease. Now, my team took a prototype product and tested the sales channel and pricing and payment strategy for this in Southeast Asia. Now, the only way we could learn about what worked was by trying and just failing over and over again. In this diagram, you see three tests, but in reality, it was dozens of tests. And in the beginning, when you've got these tiny, tiny numbers, it's pretty sad, pretty miserable. Now, the only way to get closer to what works is to really figure out what doesn't work. Now, your consumers will tell you whether you figured it out or not by their actions, not their words. So that means they'll either give you their rupees or shillings, or they will not hand that over to you. Um, so what this image shows you is that pretty much nothing worked in the beginning until it did. It took us nine months of selling dribbles in the marketplace until we cracked the formula for the sales, um, for the sales channel as well as the price and payment strategy. And when we cracked it, we knew we did because it led to a consistent 40% sales conversion rate. Now, this means that if you applied the formula that um, my team discovered, 40 out of 100 people you reach would have given you their money. So for new products that don't exist in the world today, they don't have a benchmark. So iterative testing and rigorous data collection is essential to applying pricing and payment, strat pricing and payment strategy. And today, we're not talking about the process of iterative testing, like I've shown you here um, or described here uh, using this graph, because we don't have time to cover that level of detail. But instead, we're going to focus on the strategy to give you some ideas that you can take back to your work immediately. Pricing is about value creation. Now, 80% of time, the statement I'm about to say is true. Your customer is not buying what you're offering because you haven't created enough value. Now, pricing and payment strategy is about overcoming the context by creating enough value to merit your customer's hard earned money. So the first step you see here on the left is to map out the landscape you're working in. What is the context? Where are the constraints? Where are the friction points that keep your customer from giving you their shillings? So we're gonna take a look at it from an internal and external perspective. So internal, we'll take a look at the cost that your organization incurs in order to make and deliver your offering to customers. And then look at it externally as well too, um, to, uh, in, in terms of the ability to pay. And what you see is that you have challenges of actually selling to this uh, particular community that has limited cash. So step one is to understand the context. Step two is to then look for innovative ways to overcome the constraints to your context. So you might think that your innovation is the technology that you've created or the product, but really sometimes the innovation is about finding the right use case and product mix that solves the most acute pain point for your customer or designing a payment strategy that eliminates the risk for your customer in the buying decision or maybe even partnering to create a more compelling value proposition. So with that, Let's get started by looking at the costs. So regardless of what you're selling or the type of organization that you are, or if you're receiving subsidies, you must take a look at your internal business context. You must take a look at the costs. Now, I know looking at financials can be scary, but really it's important to understand where you are at all times. So you just, so you don't have a few months and then, you know, you run out of cash. So, really understanding how much your price covers of the various stages of costs that your business incurs is essential. So the first cost is the cost of goods sold. So that's all the costs for the product or service that you're making. The second is operations. And what I've included in here is all the people, the HR, marketing, distribution, et cetera. The third is capital expenditure. So if, that's, if you're buying any equipment or any infrastructure that needs to be built, that's the third one. The fourth is the financing to finance the capital expenditures or the cost of doing business. And then the fifth is the money that you need to grow and scale. 
Now, it's critical to get clear on how much your costs are under all five categories. And usually folks stop looking at cost categories after costs uh, one through three. And that's because they're the more obvious expenditures, but doing so greatly underestimates your real costs of doing business. Taking into account costs one and two, so the cost of goods sold in your operations, will show something I like to call your operational viability. This means you're covering your day-to-day -day running costs as long as nothing breaks down. Next, taking into, into account the costs um, for capital expenditures and financing as well means that you are financially viable. You're covering your day-to-day -day costs and the cost for additional equipment and any financing needed to bridge the cash flow. Now, finally, the gold star is to include costs associated with scaling as well, because when you are able to grow organically and don't require additional investment, either in debt or equity, the constraints to your business, um, because there are constraints to your business that come from seeking external money to scale. Now, what can get tricky is when parts of your enterprise is subsidized with grants. We all know that grants can and do run out. And then you would need to either make up that cost by increasing the sales volume or increasing the price. Now, increasing the price is hard to do after you've already set a price in the marketplace. For entrepreneurs, be careful with your assumptions of what assets you can leverage in your organization. You may be, you may be only um, used to pricing the cost of the product and potentially some part of the operating costs, such as marketing, and you then might assume that the larger business will cover the other costs. You might want to check if you'll be charged a transfer pricing or the cost of colleagues time that might be allocated back to your business unit. So understanding these costs is important because um, pricing correctly will help you um, hopefully overcome and cover all of these costs um, when you're a sustainable and running business. So a few questions to ask yourself is this. How much does your price cover for each of these costs? How much is then being subsidized? So at what level of viability are you? And how might these different levels of cost coverage impact the growth of your venture? Ideally, you would price to charge to cover all of your costs plus a margin if you're profit making in order to run a fully sustainable business. Now, I think that this is probably pretty basic, pretty straightforward, but it was really good. I think it's really important to go over just the fundamentals of what your internal costs are because price needs to cover it. Let us go to a poll. And I just wanna see for all of the, those um, with live enterprises out there, what level of costs do you cover? Is it operational? So that's just the day-to-day -day running costs. Financial, so you cover the costs of capital investments as well as financing. Um, growth, which means you cover the capital needed for growth, or maybe you just don't know yet. Uh, so this is really fascinating. So we've got operational at 47% and then don't know yet around 41. Um, and then a few are able to cover growth. That's fantastic. That's a really hard thing to achieve. Great. Now, let's look at the second half of context setting, the external market context. Serving low-income consumers is challenging because of this dynamic. Hopefully this looks familiar to you. There is little money in the system, but costs of serving this particular customer group can be much higher. Now let's look at a few examples of the added cost for serving low income. The biggest one I've seen in my experience is behavior change. Next to that is financing and also the reach. These are often hidden in the early stage of your business and only discovered as time goes by when you see your operational costs really inflating being much higher than expected. Meanwhile, at the same time, there's less money in the system because we've got limited household cash flow and these households tend to not have access to consumer credit and they also potentially lack um, a safety net. So let's go through some examples of each of these. So behavior change. These are the costs to your business required to get um, a consumer to, to adopt a new habit. So think about education campaigns on safe drinking water, clean cook stoves, um, about nutrition and maternal health, or how about having consumers switch from open defecation to toilets or switching from lighting a kerosene lamp to making sure a solar lamp is charged up. 
So there are a lot of hidden costs here. And this example here is around um, the importance of hand washing with soap to prevent um, diarrheal disease and pneumonia. Now, these costs are seen in advertising. They're incurred to your business through sales, delivery, and also potentially after sales servicing. So take a look at where the costs lie in actually getting your consumers to uh, make a change in their behavior and potentially figure out how do you instead build it into your business model um, or work with partners to help you um, reduce some of those uh, basic costs for behavior change. Then there is the obstacle of financing when there's no access to consumer credit. I really love this one and I've named it the pricing black hole of death, which sounds really dramatic. Um, then if you're in it, actually, it feels just that dramatic. So don't fall into the dead zone for pricing. And I got this out of Histra's book, Scaling Up Business Solutions to Social Problems that scales this, um, that describes this challenge perfectly. So on the left hand side, you'll see that the price of your product must be low enough to not require consumer credit. And this is usually around 20 US dollars, depending on the particular market that you're in. Or on the right hand side, it needs to be high enough to be able to cover the additional operational costs to cover credit. And this is usually over 150 US dollars. So you'll see here in the images, that's a mobile phone, that's a motorbike. And you'll see that in low income um, settings, you'll see those are ubiquitous um, everywhere. So why can't they afford my product? Now, if your product falls in between these price points and there's no widely available consumer credit nor mobile money to, to facilitate payment collection, then you will have a product that consumers cannot afford to pay in cash and also does not generate enough cash flow to cover the additional costs of installment payments failure to repay and spoiled inventory. And this is the pricing black hole of death. So I'm not sure how many of you all have um, been in this situation or if this resonates with you, but this is something that I see all the time. Now, the good news is this scenario will slowly disappear over time with the growth of mobile money platforms such as M-Pesa and also consumer credit facilities such as Payjoy. Let's look at the next example. So reach. Now reach, it may cost more to reach low income consumers because they may live in a rural area. Now, one of the trickiest places I've worked in is in Indonesia with an archipelago of 16,000 islands. And you can imagine how complicated and costly logistics are there. Reach may also be about finding target customers when you're serving a niche market. Um, an example from my previous work is trying to reach families with children with learning disabilities. What we found is that there is often not good data on who these families were, even with school systems. Um, now, the resources for testing for learning, learning disabilities in local language did not exist in that country. And also, there's often so much stigma that many families would not test their children. So sometimes the cost of reaching your target market is high because of a niche market or stigma. Now, to summarize, there are potentially hidden costs that you need to um, take into consideration and build into your financial model from behavior change, financing, and reaching your target customer. So it's really important that you know these in advance so they don't surprise you um, after the fact. Now, we knew that there is the challenge of having it much more costly to serve this particular customer. And then we know that there is less money, less ability to pay. Now, in a particular household, they may have the money to pay for your product in an entire year's time. But how much disposable income or disposable cash do they have to make your purchase right now? So it can be helpful to figure out what are your customers' major expenditures to understand how your price compares to an existing household expenditure? And then it also helps if your product can provide savings to any of these in an immediate and perceivable way, which would then justify spending on your offering. Now, aside from household cash flow, we also know that any shocks to the household can tip a low income household into poverty because there might not be a financial safety net. So if someone falls ill, dies, or an income earner in the household loses their job, it also poses a risk to your business 
if your product depends on multiple payments to be affordable. So bear that in mind. So it can be helpful to look at household cash flow and look for discretionary income, or what I mean by that is cash that is not already allocated to um, existing expenditures. And it's good to understand how many income earners are in your household your typical tar for your typical target customer, how di diversified are their sources of income, and how many at-risk members are in the household of your target consumer. And maybe this is um, the case when I was doing some work about 10 years ago in East Watinia, uh, what was then Swaziland. It was uh, a very high HIV AIDS um, population in the country, which meant that the number of at-risk members in their household is about um, 10, 10 people to one income earner. And that makes for a fairly risky situation when making um, installment payments. Okay, so mapping out the challenges on ability to pay for from your target consumer perspective can help you design a payment strategy to match the household cash flow and manage your consumer and business risk. So looking at this, it, pa it paints a pretty depressing story. However, knowing where the challenges are in terms of costs for your business and challenges for your target customer can go a long way in helping you set a, set a price and design a payment strategy that helps overcome these challenges. So remember to be a sustainable business, we need to cover our costs laid out in the first few slides and illustrated here in more detail. The most sustainable way to cover your costs is to make sure your price covers, the, covers these costs. So how do we do that in a low income setting? Before I get into that, we have a poll. Um, I'd like to know which aspect of ability to pay are most challenging for this community. So I'll give it just a few seconds here to see oh behavior change whoa a hundred percent okay now we've got okay here we are we've got about 50 percent behavior change 20 percent financing um and then household cash flow 22 percent great that gives me a sense of what you all are are challenged with thank you Okay, now the first few slides were really sobering, but this is where it gets interesting and fun. So fear not. When we are working on pricing and payment strategy, overcoming the obstacles around cost and cash flow is all about focusing on value creation for your consumer. So throw out any willingness to pay surveys you have and don't believe what anyone says about buying your product. Consumers and research studies are nice and they want to make you happy, so they will tell you what they think you want to hear. This is especially the case if you're paying them in some way. Now, I primarily only trust the data when someone has given me their hard-earned rupees or shillings in exchange for a product or service, or they give me a deposit for a product or service. Now, they will only do this if I'm giving them something that has more value than the money exchanged. Dushan sent in a great question earlier. He said, um, what, to, what do we do if your community is used to receiving products or services for free? Now, from my experience, free is deceptive. If a product or service is offered freely, we must know whether it is genuinely meeting a consumer pain point or if there's still room for improvement. What I have found is that low-income consumers do understand that free does not necessarily mean good. And they may be willing to pay if a similar product or service meets the pain point significantly better. Now, you must be differentiated in adding more value. So you might not be able to differentiate and add more value for the entire community that you're serving, but you may be able to do this for a niche part of the community. Um, if that's the case, then you would need to see how big this niche community is to make sure the market is big enough to create a sustainable and viable business for you. So that is a really great question, Dushan. Thank you. Now let's look at all the ways that we can create value. Again, value creation is about solving a pain point, pain point and or providing a gain. And I know you all have live ventures out there, so I don't need to expound on this too much. 
Typically, the one that people will pay more for is solving a pain that is acute. That means that is urgent and critical. So I'll focus on this for this lecture. Now, the value of um, solving a pain makes up much of the mental equation that goes into the price people are willing to pay to willing to pay Solving a pain uniquely is the foundation of building a sustainable enterprise And if you're not able to sell you really have to go back to the basics and look at this first Are you creating value for your customer by, by solving an acute pain they have? Now, this is not the pain that the government has or the UN has as laid out in their SDGs um, but pains as expressed by your customer. Now, once you have created value through your product, um, in low-income markets, we must also remove the obstacles that get in the way of purchase. Now, typically, these fall into two categories. Eliminating these challenges for the consumer is also creating value through easing the transaction, which could merit also a higher price. Now, the first is about household cash flow. We need to match it. Low-income consumers look at the payment and frequency of payment as an indicator of affordability to them, far more than the total price. Now, of course, the total price must be less than or equal to the consumer's value held for the product. But if this is true, there are important cash flow considerations. So low-income consumers' expenditures cannot exceed the cash flow in the household because we know that consumer credit is not yet widely available in developing and emerging markets. Therefore, the price you charge must be in line with the household cash budget or you must offer credit or payment planned. The second is about eliminating risk. Payment strategies can really help you reduce purchasing risk for consumers. Low-income consumers are willing to pay more for something they know will do the job they need done versus paying less and risk losing their money altogether. This is why a trusted brand from a well-known company can be a huge asset, as well as a brick and mortar store where they can complain if something goes wrong or if the sales is through a trusted personal channel. So you have primarily two categories of levers. You have price and you have payment. Now on the pricing side, you can create more value through solving a more acute, acute pain point or doing that better than competition evaluating the product and service mix in your offering. So really getting clear on what is the job to be done and what you're solving for. And then finally, also bundling with external products and services through partnerships. Doing any of these things to increase the value may allow you to choose a higher price to cover the higher cost of serving this market. Now, I know this might, might sound counterintuitive to raise the price um, for a low income consumer market. What I'm saying is to is that what we must look at is increasing the value to merit the money that they have earned. Now, if what you have created doesn't create enough value, they just simply won't buy it. So increasing the value may actually make them want to buy the product or service, even if the price is higher. So, um, let's see, I lost track a little bit here. Once you have a price, you're going to need to determine if the if it matches the household cash flow or if it triggers risk aversion, if the price point is too high or the product is deemed too risky due to safety or newness. And so that for those uh, challenges, you need to take a look at the payment levers. So again, we create value either by solving a pain point, such as providing health care, or providing a gain, such as entertainment. Often in social impact or development work, we mistake needs for demand, that someone may need some, but someone may need something, but may not demand it. And this is because they might not know that they have this challenge, and then you need to create an education campaign, or it is not as urgent as other things in their life. So you can create more value when you solve problems that are acute, meaning they are serious or urgent, and creating education campaigns can help you sort of show the urgency or the seriousness of the problem, but they're also costly, so you need to build it into the cost structure of your business. You also create more value when others uh, solving challenges that others have not been able to solve or solving them in a better way um, that the current competition has. If you 
Also, if you saw if your solution solves many problems at once, that's also a huge plus. And finally, if the problem you solve reduces costs for the household or brings money into the household, that's also a huge way to um, create value for your customer and should definitely be used in your sales pitch. So the more value you create, the more your customer is willing to pay. Let's take a look at an example of this. So Vision Spring. Vision Spring provides glasses for low-income consumers. Their innovation when entering the market was to drive operational costs down by training a team of micro-entrepreneurs to do simple eye exams and provide basic non-prescription lenses for their community. The value of this product is immediately perceived by the user because they can see and can often mean an income earner can carry on making money for the household. So they were innovative because they solved, they solved an acute pain point. They solved the pain point better than what competition was doing out there because actually there was um, there are very few competitors that could actually price um, to an affordable, to a level that was affordable to low income communities. And also because their product uh, potentially can bring money to the household, it justifies um, the initial invest investment and expenditure for the family. Great. Let's take a look at the next price lever. This is about looking at your product and service mix. So the first question I like to ask is, what is the job to be done? Now, ideally, this is done before you have created the product to keep you open to various solutions. Now, a job to be done isn't a product or service or a specific solution. It is the higher purpose for why customers, for which customers buy products and services, because they don't buy products and services, they hire solutions to get a particular job done in their life. Now, the images here are not a low income example, but they're helpful to illustrate the concept. So, for example, people don't need a lawnmower. They need short grass that could be achieved with special grass seed that doesn't grow after a certain height or a goat that eats grass. Um, so what is the job to be done for your low income customer? And are there other ways to solve it? Now, this is great if you're in the ideation phase. So I saw like about 40% of you all are in the ideation phase. Now, others of you already have a technology and in this case, um, you really want to take a look at what are you solving for and what is the most acute use case. Often your technology can be applied in many different ways. In each way it is applied, it can solve for different pain points. So identifying which application creates the most value for your consumer can also help you bring financial viability to your business. And I, in the next slide, I have an example from the solar lighting industry that illustrates this. So the key is to create the product and service mix that gets the job done as defined by your customer and solves for the most acute pain point. So let's take a look at the evolution of the solar industry. Solar lighting companies started out solving for, li for lighting specifically for the use case of studying. And they found that this didn't create enough value, um, enough money to make a viable business. So then they looked at a larger problem of energy needs. So it's no longer about lighting, but it's about energy needs and expanded their use case to solve for more pain points and potentially ones that were more acute to create more value. So for example, they added mobile phone chargers to the same technology and then developed a product that could also be used for appliances and, and then used for their business, which then starts to bring in more income to the household to justify the costs. So what is the use case for your technology that will increase the value and allow you to increase your price to cover all of your costs of doing business? Now, the next and last price lever I want to talk to you about is about bundling with external products um, through partnerships. Now, think about external products and partnerships that take your offering to the next level. A great non-low income example of this is Fitbit devices or exercise watches. They're great for tracking your movement and can help you keep mo motivated and reach your exercise goals. Now, the value of this device is then taken to the next level when it is combined with insurance companies who also care about a healthier you. Now, these days, insurance companies are providing discounts on insurance coverage when these devices are used. So the discounts that they provide could actually pay for the cost of the product itself. So that's quite 
a wonderful um, way to add value to the offering is by partnering with an insurance company. The next low income consumer example of this is in digital, digital education and came from um, inspiration from a recent project of mine. So digital training can provide useful knowledge and skills that can be immediately valuable to learners. But in some markets, the value of this digital training can be elevated significantly with, when partnering with an academic institution to create an accredited qualification. Because in some low-income markets, getting a certification can help you differentiate yourself from a crowded, in a crowded marketplace or even get you a promotion with your current employer. So for low-income communities, accredited training may then make the investment of time and money worth it. Here is a great example from MicroInsure and Airtel. MicroInsure is a social enterprise dedicated to providing affordable insurance products to emerging markets at scale. And they were able to significantly increase their value proposition by partnering with Airtel, who would then reward loyal Airtel customers with free insurance as long as they spent two US dollars with Airtel. So imagine that you're already spending on airtime and now that same amount provides your family with free health insurance. That is incredible. So in summary, there are three different price levers. The first is really making sure that you have a unique solution for a pain point as illustrated by Vision Spring. The next is looking at your product and service mix to make sure that you are um, creating one that solves the most acute use case for your customer. And this is illustrated by Solar Lighting and Green Light Planet. And then finally, external bundling and partnerships as illustrated by MicroInsure and Airtel. So now that we have created an offering that consumers definitely value, let's take a look at the payment side. Sometimes the consumer feels you're definitely solving a pain point, but the amount is more than they can pay all at once, or they feel that paying all at once is too risky. So if payments are needed to match household cash flow, you can consider these three payment strategy, strategies, installment payments, pay as you go, and subscription. Now, if you need to eliminate risk, you can look at these three strategies. Um, or these two strategies, free trial and money back guarantee and Groupon and group purchasing. And also the other strategies for matching household cash flow um, will help eliminate risk because the consumer can then decide to not pay any more if their product doesn't need uh, meet their expectations. Um, that cost, of course, is then passed to your, to your business. Let's take a look at examples of this. So free trial, this is one of the most effective ways of overcoming a barrier to trial. If you know your product is going to create a lot of value to your consumer and they just don't know it yet, then you have a barrier to trial. Now, allowing consumers to try your product for a period of time with no money up front significantly reduces, re reduces friction in the sales process. Now, the free trial needs to last long enough for the consumer to perceive the value of the product. So for example, one of the major values of a clean cook stove is saving on fuel. And the impact of the saving is only realized over accumulating the savings for, let's say, a one month period of time. So Toyola, a clean cook stove company in Ghana, offers a no money down free trial for one month. And then they ask the family to put all the money saved on fuel into a money box. At the end of the month, the sale agent visits and then shows them the accumulated savings and that is used for the down payment for the stove. This method does add to your cost of operations through spoiled products, the return, but cost savings were also incurred through reducing the time it takes, um, it takes to make a sale in the first place. This is also um, a great example of installment payments that helps match the cash flow when families don't have access to credit. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, they feel that if the product is not performing as expected, they can stop payment um, and that reduces their total losses. And then secondly, they feel there's an outlet for getting help or getting reimbursed if there's an issue because there's a continued payment relationship with the company. The next example is pay as you go, and it's most widely known through purchasing call and data credit for mobile phones. So the application of this model has been really pioneered through the solar lighting industry, which has combined their products with a technology that allows consumers to top up their credit as they do on a mobile phone. Now this method relies on the functionality of their product to be rendered 
unusable to the consumer when the credit is used up. But this is a really great way to go as well. All right. Now, group buying is something that we don't see much in Europe or the US, except through potentially Groupon. But this is actually very common in low income communities to get discounts on bulk buying. The most ex famous example that I'm showing here is not about bulk buying, um, but is about microcredit solidarity lending, where consumers purchase financial products together. What this does is it reduces the operational cost of the business as well as can reduce the perceived risk to the borrower because taking this leap with peers, um, their friends, validates their buying decision and can make trying something new less scary. Now finally, the last tool in your arsenal of tools is subscription business models. This is one way of converting your product to a service. The example here isn't a low income example, but I thought it was a good one to illustrate the concept where Nike switched from a product shoes to a service, the provision of shoes for growing kids. This new program is designed to make shopping easier for parents who really struggle with getting enough shoes for their kids as their um, child's feet are growing rapidly. And instead of taking the kids to the shore, trying on pair after pair, and the other kid is running around uh, pulling things off the shelf, um, the Nike Adventure Club will ship them shoes um, anywhere from four pairs to a dozen, depending on the subscription that the parents choose. And I really like this because it really takes a look at creating value in different ways, not just about, you know, the shoe, but the service of not um, service of having it delivered to your house and not actually having to go to the store um, was uh, clearly a very big pain point as well. Now, the subscription payment strategy should really be considered for low income business models especially when compliance is really important because when you have a subscription, then you continue to use the product and it really helps build a habit. So if you need to show, if your product takes a long time for the value to be perceived, such as nutrition or safe drinking water, you need them to keep taking the, um, uh, the product or keep using the service for some period before they have the intended health effects, then subscription could be an interesting way to go about creating that behavior. Now, I have gone through a number of tools with you and I have not mentioned um, other tactics. So such as high, having higher income consumers pay more and cross, cross subsidizing for low income. So the best BOP example of this is Airvind Eye Hospital or Tom Shoes. Um, the another tactic that is popularly used is looking at another stakeholder in the system who cares about the same social outcome as your consumer. And in that case, you're changing the payer from the consumer to the government or the foundation or a donor. Now, all of those strategies are also fine, but I wanted to focus on models where low income consumers are the buyer and the payer. Um, so if there are other strategies you have used and are not listed here, please share, email me directly because I'm always keen to add to the toolkit. I've done a ton of talking and I'm going to pause to see which tool in the toolkit resonated with you most. So let's take a look at that poll. Product and service mix, external build it, bundling and partnerships. Unique solution for pain is up there as well and pay as you go. Um, Okay, great subscription, free trial, money back guarantee. So it looks like the highest ones are for external bundling and partnerships in product and service mix. It's really great. Thank you very much for that. Now, I promised I would go over the learning objectives uh, to make sure that we hit all of them. So today we talked about the cost of your business the external environment in the market. And the key thing is to understand the context, to know what it is that you're trying to overcome. Knowing is really half the battle. Now, there are many ways to overcome challenges on payment to match the household cash flow and reduce risk, but really at the core of it is to figure out if you're really creating value in a unique way that people perceive and is sufficiently differentiated. So, Hopefully I have um, adequately achieved these learning objectives. I'm very happy to 
um, take any questions and I'm going to stop the um, slides here and go back on the video so I can answer your questions. Oh, I can't hear you, Danielle. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I just started talking without my mic on. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for all of that information. That was a ton of really specific and practical advice. Uh, we had a ton of great questions come in as you were speaking, and I was trying to organize them as we went. And I have a feeling we're going to get a ton more coming in right now. Um, the chat great. is blowing up again. So let's see, where should we start? Um, we had some questions come in around the costs. And I'll just, mm -hmm. let's just go for it. Uh, how do these theories and models change when the product offered is actually a service with considerable operational liability? So maybe some additional costs. Okay, so the question is, how are these theory? Can we get a little more specific about how they are applied? Because when I look at, um, so cost of goods sold, for example, if it's a service, would be like the people. So let's say you're running a tutoring program, your cost of goods is like the people. Um, and that turns, sort of switches uh, from an operational cost, the HR, so the supporting overhead into the people. Um, so if I could get a little bit of clarification on specifically what they mean by that, I'd be happy to answer. Sure, Al, if you can let us know in the chat. And it was, um, uh, there was a few plus ones on that question. So we'll see if someone else wants to jump in with more specificity there. Um, in terms of the cost, you talked about the different steps going up and, and Savita asked, how would one measure scaling costs? Okay, so that means your cost to growth. Now, I think the important thing here is to first understand like where your cost of business is now and then understand like what is it that you need to actually um, achieve sort of your next milestones of growing within your same community or you know overseas so your cost of growth is going to be that additional amount it's not that like the amount that is going to be used for um you know, running your operations or the capital expenditures and the financing, but it's really like what's going to be required to like open new office and multiply that by the number of offices that you're looking at. Now, I think it's a good idea to um, talk to someone that is working in um, uh, sort of investment and in finance specifically to see how, um, I guess if you're looking for external capital to how it's calculated, because they have probably specifics to that. But the way that I would just rudimentally define it is just everything that is beyond um, sort of your cost of running to the business day to day and your capital expenditures and the financing that's required just for doing what you're doing now in your singular footprint. Mm -hmm. And on a related note, Garrett was asking for more clarity around the financial costs. So um, asking, is that related to debt and equity obligations that you may owe, or are there other factors in the financial costs to consider? It's a really good question. I mean, primarily what I was thinking about is the debt and equity um, that you may owe. And from an entrepreneurial setting, it would be sort of what the additional um, cost of financing would be for um, for the business to um, inject into your venture. So it might not be debt or equity, but it might be, you know, going and pitching again to your investment committee internally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the time as well yeah. uh, that your team takes, for sure. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, this is a great question from Theo. How can we manage the price of products in a competitive market? So say that again. How do we manage or think about the pricing side of things of products in a in a more competitive market? Yeah, actually, the great thing about a competitive market is you have a benchmark. So if you're I mean, ideally, you can go lower than the current price in the market and um, compete against price. But really, the better way is to look at, you know, the value side of things. So. Um, if you are going to be pricing more or especially if it's substantially more, then you have to really be able to tell your customer, like, what is so much better 
um, or how are you solving their pain and providing the service much, much better than um, what how competitors are doing it now. So it's actually really wonderful to have competitive benchmarks. And you can see already in the marketplace for, I guess, um, I really like to look at non-BOP examples as well too, because the market dynamics are very similar is that you can take a look at, um, uh, you know, Uber and how they're pricing um, in the marketplace and how does that compare to the existing price? It might not actually even be cheaper. It might be more expensive in some countries that are paying cash, but it's providing, you know, actually a more secure system and, a, and it's more convenient actually um, for some types of users. And so taking it, so price is not, um, you don't always need to actually go and go and price lower than your competitor but it's really important to understand if you're pricing higher than your competitor, um, how you're justifying that. Okay, great. They're all, all these concepts are so connect, interconnected to yeah. right, in each scenario. Um, we do have a few questions more around value creation. So Charlie is wondering, um, how do you eliminate risk when your product is a service? So in her example, it's around education. Okay, I need a little bit more. Um, so risk in which area? So is it risk about, um, so do the, is it the families perceive risk of investing in an education product and will they see the return? Or is it your risk of business if you're doing a multiple payments, installment payments and they might not pay later? So which aspect are you talking okay. about? Um, Charlie can weigh in there. Uh, she did have another comment here, which might be connected, let me read it. Similar to the tutoring question on cost, what are ways to de-risk the cost of service for lower income families? Operations slash HR are the biggest overhead in a cultural context where education is free. So um, does that help? What, so can you repeat that one more time? It's just a lot. What are ways to de-risk the cost of a service for lower income families? Operation and HR are the bigger overhead costs in a cultural context where education is free. So de-risking, I guess, the the um, the overhead. Well, that doesn't really make sense. Charlie, maybe you can share more. Oh, wait. Um, as an example, she says you can't give them a free trial, as in the example of a clean cook stove. So how do you give a trial and reduce that, I guess, the risk of it creating value for the family? Ah, I see. I mean, if you you might not be able to give a free trial, but you could give uh, potentially a money back guarantee. So if they feel that their child has not, uh, that's a little bit tricky though, because education outcomes are <laughs> not necessarily yeah. dependent on, you know, the input um, that you're giving them. Um, in my past experience working in education, like showing evidence, if there's sort of evidence that your product is, will produce a particular um, outcome better than the existing school system, for example, then that helps reduce risk. Um, in the case of, you know, they're not sure whether whether um, to buy or to buy or not, if they have um, leveraging those that have already purchased. So if they get a recommendation from a friend or a family or a neighbor, someone they know that actually have has used it and felt there's value. So really looking at incentive systems where you're um, using a personal channel to sort of um, uh, advertise uh, your product and service really helps. Uh, um, increase the sales conversion rate as well because it's coming from a trusted channel. And then finally, you can think about actually group purchasing. So oftentimes people are hesitant to buy a loan. They feel, oh, am I making the right decision? But if you say, you know what, actually, we'll provide this service to this community if this community has a certain number that's willing to commit. And that group purchase then um, sort of helps people feel a little bit more secure about investing, making that kind of investment. Of course, that's a really uh, different kind of sale. It's a longer sales um, uh, strategy than others, but that's another way to approach it. So hopefully that gives you a few, a few tactics. Yes, great. Again, so so intertwined and connected to the specific offering too. Um, but these strategies are great, really helpful. We have a co couple questions more related to B2B or thinking about the consumer on the organizational level rather than the individual. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? We have Nikisha is wondering what strategy does one use to have a pricing strategy at the organizational level, not the individual? And then there was one about B2B. Um, thoughts on matching an equivalent to the household cash flow when you're working B2B? Oh, okay. Well, you know what? I think 
I mean, in my mind, um, in terms of selling to B2B and pricing and payment for B2B, um, you do have to think of the uh, business entity and sort of um, the challenge. You're all, first of all, it's always the fundamentals of like the challenge that you're trying to solve for them. And you might want to look at, well, how are they solving it now? Are they paying an existing service provider to do it? Like, so what are they currently using? Um, to overcome the particular problem that you're trying to solve for them. That gives you some sense of, um, you know, where your price point should be at. Now, if there's nothing and they're doing nothing, then you have to uh, potentially have them share with you, well, what is, what is the cost that's being incurred to their business right now? You know, potentially it's about risk. Well, um, what is it? What happens if that worst case scenario happens um, to their business? So, but in any case, you approach a sales to a business, it's always a person that you're talking to, but you just need to understand like the, not the person's challenges, but their organizational challenges. And it's in some ways, the framing is very similar. So it's not the pain point of the person, but the pain point of the organization in comparing against um, the expenditures that their budget is right now. Um, so looking at, well, you know, what are they currently paying for? Is this a line item that is uh, way off what they currently spend? Um, in particular, if you're selling to a corporate, there's certain thresholds of uh, budgeting power. So at sort of lower levels of management, you might be able to, they might only be able to sign off on a certain amount of, of an invoice. And, um, and so you might want to price so it's just below that. So you don't have to have it escalated to actually um, go to a higher level manager. So take that into consideration, but really understanding, I think, you know, what are they currently using right now? What are their cost of business to frame it? It's, it's very similar as it is to a consumer. Um, so hopefully that answers both of those questions. Yes, wonderful. And just noting that we are at the hour. So if you are here and need to run, um, don't worry, you'll get the replay shortly. And so you can catch up if you do need to run. Um, and I think we can take a few more questions, right, Ling Ling? Because we have a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we won't be able to cover them all. Otherwise, we'll be here for another hour. But we can take a few more. And just to remind everyone that um, the replay will come in your email along with links to some of the resources and tools that Ling Ling mentioned, including um, how to access her website and download the PDF on the pricing black hole of death and some, some next steps if you're curious to keep learning in this area. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, I lost my place. What was I going to ask you next? Well, we have some questions about testing. Um, so at okay. the very beginning, you mentioned some of your projects and, and how some of these learnings came to be. And we had a lot of questions coming around testing. <laughs> so let's see, where should we start? Um, Saba mentioned, Saba asks, you mentioned your team had to test iter iteratively on the ground in order to determine what works best. How did you make the local connections to dis deploy your distribution models? testing in market is like a whole other course but I will answer that specific question it's a really um, testing it or learning how to test iteratively is super important and a critical skill to have just to um, sort of make sure you're not building something that doesn't you know work um, post launch um, so the question of you know how do I build the distribution channels it's really about making sure you connect with um, sort of who's in the community. So the first thing is you really have to understand um, the country that you're working in and that community that you're working in specifically. Is there like a head of that community that you need to get access to and ask permission? I never, um, in entering, you can't just enter in a low income community and start selling. It doesn't work like that. So you really need to actually get someone to introduce. And so typically, um, whoever I'm working with, I find someone who has those connections. And, you know, it's a real soft skill going in and um, making those local connections to whoever's the head of the community. And often they will have suggestions on you know, who, what might be the right channels. Now, when you're thinking about testing um, or distribution for testing, you don't need distribution all over the country. You just need distribution potentially in that one neighborhood. Um, so it could just be a few you know, retail shops. It could be you know, a, a few guys on a, on a bicycle, on a moped, uh, going around distributing for you and you just, you know, sell, you just uh, pay them uh, for their time worked. So it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It just needs to look like um, on the outside, that's a, a legitimate business. So you're not um, 
first of all, you're not breaking any you know, laws or regulations of the country uh, by doing your distribution and your sales, but um, it needs to look legitimate. So uh, what we've done in the past is we've actually made brand t-shirts so that people you know, look proper and you know, name tags and be surprised how far that goes <laughs> actually in making you look uh, very legitimate and credible and, and creating business cards as well too. Um, but the most important thing is to make sure that you have the trust and the okay of the community that you're entering. Great. Yeah, that touches on some of the other questions that we had um, around testing. And like you said, this one um, could lead into a whole nother learning lab, but um, maybe in relation to the pricing and payment side of things, how do you know when to change your strategy? So give up on one thing that you're testing and move on to the next, especially, you know, in the pricing context, it can be tricky to know what signals to read and use to make that decision is really it's really hard um there's no particular formula i think you really um i like to go well first of all it needs to be combined with both the data that you're getting so hopefully when you're doing your testing um you're collecting really rigorous data on like you know what is your uh pricing and sales strategy and then look at the sales results from that and market and then if you want to have a different uh sales strategy a different price go to a different community and that where they're far away and they're not talking to each other. So they'll get really upset if they find out someone else is getting a different price. And you track that and you look at the data. So it's really important to make it quantitative and not just with your gut. Now, that being said, if you look at the numbers and they're clear and make sure they're clear, because sometimes if you actually are testing too many things at once, you don't know what is working with you and what is working against you. Um, so it's really important to have clear data, but you combine that with your gut and your intuition as well too with, you know, what the team says, you know, do we feel that we really have any chance or, of, you know, going continuing down the strategy? Have we really, you know, run down um, all the particular tactics um, with this particular channel? And then, you know, you, you just have to make a call and, you know, move on. You might also want to look at it from, you know, sort of the cost, the burn rate to your business. If it's very expensive to do it in the particular way that you've done as well, too, that might be an uh, additional factor. But I like to make it a combination of both um, quantitative and your uh, gut instinct as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And finally, one more thing is um, if you don't know what's happening, if something is fuzzy, interview your customers, go and just have a casual conversation with them and just ask why. So mm -hmm. ideally, you're able to connect with the customers so they're not just telling you what you want to hear. Oh, I love your product, but I can't buy it now because of like these 20 reasons. Hopefully they can just tell you, you know, well, what's the real thing? It's because I'm prioritizing this instead of something else. And if you continually get this, then it's really like the value proposition isn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Great advice. OK, I have um, two last questions and then we can wrap up because we're almost 10 over. So one is around uh, Sam asked, can you explain how payment levers affect value creation specifically? Um, I'm not sure if that's too specific of a question, but in terms of the connection, I suppose, between payment levers and value creation. Yeah, it's a really great question. So um, the reason, so payment levers in particular um, connect to value creation um, in this way is that it offers, in particular for matching the household cash flow, is because you are creating a way for them to pay in when they don't have enough money. So you already assume that actually there's enough value and people are very happy to buy your product. And now they, okay, they really want your product, but they actually don't have the cash right now to pay and they don't have any access to a credit facility. In this case, by giving them an installment payment or, um, or like a, a free trial is essentially giving them some level of credit. So you are creating value by creating the, giving them access to credit by giving them more information than they would have had otherwise if you weren't, you know, um, installing a strategy such as money back guarantee or free uh, a free trial, etc. So that's that's one way of doing it. Now we often don't think of um, reducing risk as value creation, but it is also value creation. So there's, what we found is that there's actually a lot of anxiety in the buying decision, because if it is for a product that is, they perceive as uh, expensive and they don't know whether it'll work or not, figuring out ways to reduce risk in that buying decision can also just 
um, can also value add, add a lot of value to them simply because they get you know better sleep at night. Like oh, now you've created a system where it's like I've been able to check through peers that they also you know friends people like me are also buying um, or. I can't think of the other thing I was thinking about, but anyhow, I'll stop there and answer some other questions. No, that's great. So yeah, I'll um, ask you one final question, which which is just uh, a fun one that Madhu asked, and I don't know if it'll be e easy to answer, um, but in your experience, what has worked the most or, or the best for low-income consumers? Do you see out of all the strategies that you mentioned, one that kind of speaks to you in your experience as being the most effective? Oh, that's a great question. But there, no, there's not a one size fit all. It's it really is a mix. And there are all it's all very much in, intertwined and sort of designed the business model as well, too. I would say that, um, you know, just really hold to the center that like very fundamental creating like creating a unique solution to an acute pain point. Like the fundamental of that is super critical because often you'll um, you know, you're getting data from your consumer from these surveys and from research studies you're doing with them that seem contrary to then what your sales are. And you think this is not making any sense. They're not making, you know, uh, um, the right decision. You know, how can they not purchase my product? But then, you know, stepping back and asking why and really just getting curious and, you know, um, is, is super important. So because people are actually making great decisions for themselves. Um, and so really just going back to it, um, that fundamental is really important. And sometimes really hard to go back to that fundamental, potentially because it's tied to a grant that you've won for, and now the whole thing is changing. So that's why the subsidies can be really confusing. Um, also, I didn't touch on this too much, but um, often with social ventures, we start with a need that's based from a government lens or um, a donor lens. So it's like, you know, particular SDG about, you know, reducing malnutrition. But then, you know, well, um, when you go and try to sell a product to prevent malnutrition that, and there's not very many people buying, then you wonder, well, you know, why is that? But then you have to take the perspective of the consumer, not the perspective of the SDG or government, because, you know, and the need as um, sort of described that way um, may not be it might not be there might not be a market there um, and who you might be selling to then is a government or um or, you know, or a donor agency that wants that problem solved, but your consumers may not um, feel it's that pressing in their lives. Mm -hmm. I think that's good advice to to close on. Um, I put up for those of you who are still here the link to Ling Ling's website where you can download, um, go to her tools page and download that PDF that she mentioned about the pricing black hole of death. So you can click learn more and you'll also get that link in the email. And I also want to share um, if if selling is a piece of the pricing and payment puzzle <clears throat> that obviously it's connected. If that's something you want to learn more about, we have the Plus Acumen Masterclass with Daniel Pink on the art of selling. So I've pulled up that link if you want to check out that masterclass. And we also will have that in the replay email for you. So um, um, lots of wonderful questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we will pass these over to you, Ling Ling, so that maybe you can create more content or blogs or uh, include more information in your newsletter. So I would suggest if you had a question that we didn't cover, keep your eye out on uh, what's coming from Ling Ling and maybe it will be answered in another um, way in the future. And yeah, uh, any final words before we wrap up? Wow, this time went by super fast. It's a topic that I'm fascinated by and could go on for hours and hours and end. So please do, if you have any other questions, um, send them along to me. I'd love to you know, create some content that can be useful to this community. Um, also, if you have some great learnings, I do, I'm definitely not the holder of you know, all the strategies out there. Send them along. And I'm, I have um, a newsletter that I send to a social innovation community. Um, uh, twice a month. And so um, if you send them along, then I'll add them to the toolkit. And the next time I create a learning lab like this, I'll include them into the mix. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and all the knowledge you shared today. Uh, it was really wonderful to have you. Thank you for moderating, Danielle. Thanks. Bye, everybody. We'll see you at the next okay. one. Bye. Bye.